how accurate is the market at predicting the direction of interest rates in the future? Now, we have a number of ways of looking at this, but let's focus today on the one the Federal Reserve uses and has pointed to in the past. This thing looks at the three-month rate 18 months down the road and says, what is the likelihood or chance that rates will be lower or higher than they are currently? On November 10th of 2022, this particular spread inverted for the first time. And that was the market saying, suddenly there was a non-trivial chance 18 months into the future from that point, the three-month rate could be lower than it was at that time. And if you do the math here, we're coming up on 18 months since that first inversion. In fact, 18 months will be on May 10th of 2024, about two and a half months from now. And back in November of 2022, the three-month rate was at the time 4.09%. Right now, it's in the 520s. So the three-month rate would have to drop about a point, a full percentage point, in the next two and a half months in order for this near-term forward spread to have been technically and precisely true in its prediction. So we're, that's the thing, though. The near-term forward spread, like a lot of these bond yield spreads, are not predictions. These are not crystal balls. What they're telling us is a range of probabilities. And the probability is about the general direction and behavior of interest rates. And when you look back in the past, a lot of these cycles, in fact, all of these cycles, look a lot like the current one we're experiencing, including what happens from that initial inversion point 18 months forward. Do the markets predict interest rates? No, nothing ever does. Do the markets tell us something very useful about the probabilities of how interest rates are likely to behave in the future? You bet they do, including our own interpretation of what interest rates actually mean when they are behaving in this direction. The information that we're going to use today comes from a couple of economists and researchers, one at the Federal Reserve, a fellow by the name of Anthony Dirks, and another at UNC Wil Wilmington, Daniel Soaks, and we can't thank them enough for maintaining their website, which is called neartermforwardspread.com, and I highly recommend you check it out if you want to play around with the statistics. They've got data going back to the 1960s on the near-term forward spread, and you can see for yourself just how useful this information can be. Assuming that we realize what we're getting from it is not crystal ball predictions. It tells us generally what the likelihood of the overall direction of interest rates will be, and therefore what the market is thinking about conditions that would lead to these changes in interest rates. We'll stick to the downside of each cycle in, in this particular video, and we'll talk about some of the upsides uh, when the near-term near forward spread becomes steep in a future video down the road. But going back to the last cycle where we had inversions and in interest rates moving lower, that was not 2008, we'll get to that in a minute. It was 2018 and 2019. The near-term forward spread inverted for the first time on December 31st, 2018. They got more inverted in 2019. Now, obviously, rates moved lower in 2019, so we can safely say, regardless of whatever your interpretation of the conditions in 2019, the market got that one pretty much right. And this is something we're going to encounter as we move forward in our historical review. That timing isn't, isn't everything here, because in the 2019 case, the inversion was quickly followed, at least relatively speaking, it was quickly followed by lower interest rates, whether the three-month rate or the short-term rates that the Federal Reserve uh, targets. Essentially, in that case, the inversion and then a relatively quick downturn in interest rates followed pretty closely afterwards. And that was because, well, we'll never know for sure, but it sure seemed like a, the global economy was falling into recession. The U.S. looked like it was going to fall into one, too. Only a couple of places did they actually declare one. But we also have to keep in mind, too, that, that these interest rate uh, mechanisms and interest rate measures also apply to global conditions because these business cycles that we're talking about, these recessions, they're not just U.S. recessions. They tend to be clustered with other recessions around the rest of the world. This is a more of globally synchronized system than we were ever led to believe. So 2018, we got interest rates to go lower right away. And then, of course, the pandemic came and we'll never know exactly how that was going to turn out. But we do know how it was turned out in 2008. The near-term forward spread first inverted way back in January of 2006, January 13th. 
At the time, the three-month bill rate was 4.23%. So if you do the math and go forward 18 months from there, that was July 13th of 2007, and the three-month bill rate was 483. So if we measure the literal terms of the near-term forward spread, that first inversion of January 13, 2006 was a miss because interest rates were still going up at that point. And that's what, this is what we're going to keep coming back to. And this is what also applies to the November 2022 case. When, you, when you're trying to measure and take these literal parameters from the initial inversion, you don't know exactly where interest rates stop. And so it's very difficult to see exactly what the market rate is going to be 18 months down the road because everything here is relative. Now, you fast forward six months from then, July 14th of 2006, by then, uh, the near-term forward, spreads, near -term forward spread starts to become even more inverted, but the three-month rate is up to 4.93% because the Fed is still hiking rates and short-term rates are still being pushed forward. And you go, six, you go 18 months forward from there, which is January 14, 2008. Now you see the near-term forward spread seem to work like magic. The three-month rate in January 12, 2008 is substantially lower. So even though we give this, this near-term forward spread a specific time parameter, 18 months, what we see here is maybe it's not exactly 18 months because even that initial version was only off by a little bit, by a few months before rates started to fall. So again, if you take these parameters as literal truth, exactly 18 months down the road, what will interest rates be exactly higher from where they were when we started measuring, you get a miss like this. And it isn't actually a miss because 18 months down the road, you can see clearly the mid-interest rate environment was definitely moving in the direction of lower and lower interest rates, which we see in the follow-on of the near-term forward spread later on in 2006 into 2007, which absolutely were correct. And more strenuously saying, we believe interest rates are going to go lower over the future period, whether it's specifically 18 months or somewhere around 18 months. We have to be more general in our terminology here. The cycle before that, we go back to 2001. This was a lot like 2019. The first inversion in the term forward spread was August 1st of 2000. And the three month rate was 6.07. We fast forward 18 months to February 2002 and rates are a whole bunch lower from there. Even when you look at coming out of the inversion in March of 2001, you see that rates are much lower 18 months down the road. So the 2001 cycle was pretty simple. Again, a lot like 2019, the inversion happened, rates went down pretty quickly from there within a period of several months. 1990, 1991, you see the first inversion shows up May 30th of 1989. The three month rate then was 8.58%. You fast forward 18 months, that gets you to the end of November of 1990. And the three month rate is already 7.02% and rates are already moving lower. So like the 2000, 2001 cycle, the SNL recession, that cycle, near term forward spread pretty much right on the entire time. Because again, it's relative. In an 18 month period, the probability that rates were gonna be lower was relatively high and the time component was much sooner because things developed along a much quicker path. The DBIS inversion showed up in July of 1989, again, 7.86%. And then that gets you 18 months forward to January of 1991, where the three month rate is down to 625. So the 1990, recession, like the 2001 recession, pretty clean example that the overall direction of interest rates in the not too far distant future conform to exactly what we'd expect from these inversions. Now let's go back to the early 80s and even the 1970s, the inflation recessions, the great inflation recessions. 1980-81, the first inversion shows up in October 3rd, 1980, when the three-month rate was 11.33%. And then you fast forward to 18 months to April of 1982, and the three-month rate is 13.26%. So again, in literal terms, that's another miss, at least from the initial inversion point. And the, same, the reason is the same. If you start measuring while interest rates are going up, you're not really sure where they're going to top out and then how interest rates might be compared 18 months down the road. And interest rates had gone, gone lower in that 18-month period, in November of 1981, but then they went they went right back higher before they started lower again. 
So if you look at the near-term forward spread inversion from closer to the peak where interest rates got to be late in 1980 and early 1981, you see that the inversion makes more sense. In fact, the deepest inversion was December 11th of 1980, back when the three-month rate was 17.14%. And then you fast forward 18 months from there, and interest rates are substantially lower. So it's not necessarily about measuring from when the first inversion hits, nor is it when just a little tiny inversion. We're more interested in when the market is more confident in its inversion, which, just means, which means it's more confident in conditions that will lead to lower interest rates. That's what we keep coming back to. And that period of time that it takes for that confidence to become lower interest rates, that's a variable that's very hard to predict and forecast. The cycle before that, 1980, the mess that was the great inflation. The first inversion in the near-term forward spread showed up in November, early November 1978, when the three-month rate was 8.85%. Fast forward 18 months to May 1st of 1980, and the three-month rate is 10.36%. So again, we have another initial inversion miss, and it's for the same reason. When you're measuring when interest rates are going up, or starting from when the period when interest rates are going up, it's difficult to tell how far they could continue to go up before they start to turn around. So that shows you the near-term forward spread is not an indicator of the terminal interest rate. It is simply saying the market is becoming more and more concerned that conditions will develop at some point that will lead interest rates to move lower from however or from wherever they are, however high they are at that, part, that point in time. And rates would peak in March of 1980. They were still going up uh, right through the early part of the recession because the interest rate decline in 1980 was so short. And we got into the other side of 1980 with more inflationary conditions. Interest rates went down sharply and then went right back up almost as sharply as they had gone down. So a lot of these near-term forward spread inversions if you look exactly 18 months ahead, you see rates that are higher, but rates that had also been substantially lower. So that raises another question. Are we talking about specifically 18 months ahead? Or are we talking about in an 18 month window or it's not even exactly 18 month window? Is it say 20 months or 24 months? Over the next little while, we can't take all of these parameters literally. And there are indeed conditions that change the very nature and behavior of interest rates in specific periods. But overall, you do see the same general pattern developing here. And we see it maybe the best example, 1973, 74, and 75. The first inversion in the near-term forward spread shows up May 25th of 1973. The three-month rate at that point was 6.64%. Fast forward again, exactly 18 months, November 25th, 1974. The three-month rate is 731. Again, a miss on the initial initial inversion period. And the reason that it was the same as before, all the other examples that we've gone through, because rates were still rising when the near-term forward spread first inverted. But as you can see, every point forward of June of 1973, once rates stopped rising in August of 1973, every point forward in inversion from June 1973 wasn't a miss, it was correct. Because over that period, in general terms, interest rates were indeed moving lower. So it does depend upon where you start this measurement. If you start exactly where the initial aversion shows up and if interest rates are on the rise, then it doesn't really tell you exactly when interest rates are going to be lower, though it does if you look at all of these cases where the initial inversion misses, it does tell you that in general, interest rates are moving lower just from a higher terminal point. So it doesn't tell you about the terminal point, but it does tell you about roughly 18 months down the road if rates are likely to be moving lower. And outside of 1980, 1981, once they move lower, they do tend to stay there. The unique conditions of 1980, the big difference in all of those. So what is it that makes interest rates move lower? What is it that moves the near-term forward spread, or indeed any type of yield curve spread to become inverted and negative. Well, it isn't necessarily recession, but in every single one of these cases, it has been recession. And I'm including 2019 in that. And again, it's not just the US economy that we're talking about. 
It's also the entire global system because there was a global recession in 1980, for example. There was certainly a global recession in, in 2001, believe it or not, the mild dot com recession. That happened around the rest of the world. Obviously, 2008, the Great Recession was shared pretty much everywhere. In 2019, we come back to that. While the U.S. didn't maybe didn't seem to, like it was heading into recession to some people, the market was a little bit more pessimistic on those possibilities, as well as the Federal Reserve. That's the reason why they were cutting rates, because they were a little bit concerned the recessions that were showing up around the rest of the world might eventually impact the U.S. too, because it is a globally synchronized system. In fact, when the near term, when the yield curve actually inverted for the first time way back in March of 2022, before the near term forward spread would, at the time, the near term forward spread was still steep and moving higher. But in March of 2022, in April of 2022, Federal Reserve Chairman Jay Powell said, look, we're not worried about the yield curve inversion because we've got this thing called a near term forward spread. If that one inverts, then we understand that there might be some difficulties ahead. And the reason was, as Powell said, that's really what has 100% of the explanatory power of the yield curve. It makes sense because if it's inverted, meaning the near-term forward spread, that means the Fed's going to cut, which means the economy is weak. Now, again, that's really the point here. When interest rates do start to go down, and if they are moving lower, especially from a higher level, that tells us more than likely there are conditions in the general economy, if not the monetary and financial system too, which are going to lead to rates going lower, consistent with rates going lower. That's not a set of good possibilities. As Powell was saying, the economy is weak. And that's consistent with what we see throughout the history of not just the near-term forward spread, but all these financial indications. They're not exact. They are not predictions. And we see the near-term forward spread invert back in November 2022. It didn't say, okay, 18 months exactly forward, interest rates, the three-month rate is going to be lower. What it was really saying is that about 18 months into the future, more likely than not, interest rates are going to be on their way lower. And so if we start measuring the inversions and near-term forward spread comparisons from that point forward, as we move forward, that means the market was saying by the time we get to the second half of 2024, there is a very good probability that rates are going to be moving lower. And I think as we stand right now, whether, however, wherever, whenever the Federal Reserve begins cutting rates, that's not actually the key consideration, but wherever that happens, most people would agree that interest rates are likely to be moving lower this year anyway. In fact, that's, that's exactly what the Federal Reserve says too. So that would be consistent with what the near-term forward spread is, was saying all along, really going back to late 20, 2022 and into early 2023. The question is, the variable is, what does that actually mean? Will it be like Jay Powell and everybody else is saying, soft landing, just a couple rate cuts to make sure that everything goes smoothly? Or will it be like all the other cycles in our historical look back when interest rates are moving lower as they were forecast to high probability of moving lower, recession, and not just in the United States. And that matters because, as we've talked about previously, there's a lot of other recessions springing up all around the rest of the globally synchronized world. So if we take the near-term forward spread in a way that we're supposed to, where it's actually useful, not as an actual prediction, what it was saying is that by the time we get to end of 2024, rates were more likely to be moving lower from wherever they had been at the peak part along the way. And that seems to be exactly what we're confronting. The question is, what does that mean? What are the conditions that will lead rates to go lower? And in these all these histor historical examples, what we see is that that coincides with sharply lower interest rates as recessions develop. I just had a terrific conversation, deep conversation with Lynn Alden and George Gammon about the meaning of money, the most important question that future generations are about to face. Part of that interview you can see at the link below me. The rest of it is available for Eurodollar University members and subscribers. And until next time, take care.